Shalom Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You are watching Israeli News Live. And those of you that are joining a live stream, Shalom Chabrim, many people wonder what that means. That means Shalom friends. Chabrim is the plural for friends. And uh, I haven't forgot about you on teaching Hebrew. That is going to start up very soon on my wife's channel. So be checking that out in the near future there. Uh, Rise Up Children of God is the name of her channel. Tonight, though, we're looking at Rome lays the groundwork for the third temple. And I'm talking, and when I say laying the groundwork, it's going to make more sense, I believe, after you watch tonight's program, uh, to understand exactly where I'm coming from on that. So let's go right into this and take a look at it. Turkey moves to restore relations with Russia and Israel on the same day. The World Post uh, has brought this out June 27, 2016. Of course, it was on the 26th. This was going on. John Kerry was working to reestablish the relationships there uh, with Turkey and Israel in Rome, Italy, of all places. These things were being done. So in Istanbul, Turkish leaders on Monday announced a series of landmark uh, moves meant to normalize ties with Russia and Israel after years of tumultuous relations uh, with the two leading world powers. Strengthened relationships, a result of a deal with Israel and a letter to the Russian president calling for restored ties, could lead to a boost, uh, boosted economy and tourism sector in Turkey, lucrative Mediterranean gas prospects for Israel, and a greater cooperation at a crucial time in the region. Uh, of course, Israel since 2010. Uh, this is uh, the, the flotilla incident uh, is what caused their relationship to go sour. Keeping in mind, though, Erdogan has stated already publicly that uh, his only intention for restoring ties with Israel is for the sake of the Palestinian people. That's always his goal. Okay, but in this case here, we're seeing the, the, uh, the negotiations were in Rome, Italy. As you see here in the picture with Netanyahu and John Kerry, uh, they are in Rome. And it is the Vatican that's helping sponsor these type meetings, the World Peace Negotiator. And from what I can tell, we are starting to see the groundwork laid for that 10 regions of the world that they're wanting to divide the world up into. You're gonna, we're going to go into a lot of this tonight, but everything is laying the groundwork for the building of the third temple, exactly what the Pope of Rome wants to do. And I do hope I've got a Bible within reach because I have a feeling we're going to kind of veer off of this just a little bit. Uh, because I've got to take you guys back into Daniel 11, no doubt, before we get done with this broadcast. Anyway, the, uh, this uh, was on June 27th. The Times of Israel, the reconciliation deal with Turkey will dramatically boost Israel's economy. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Monday during a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry in Rome, hours before he was expected to present the full terms of the agreement. Now, Guys, what really blows me away is the fact that suddenly, suddenly, when it looks like the world is on the brink of world war, we are seeing diplomatic relations being restored in, 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 a, in a move like no other time in history. I am blown away by this. I really am. Now we have also... Russia and Turkey were almost on the brink of war, and then suddenly things are changing even with them at the same time? I mean, we just happened, and by the way, we know that in Turkey they just had this suicide bomber in Ankara's airport. I have flown through there many times myself. You know, goes in there, blows up in the airport, kills a bunch of people. 42 people, from what I understand, were killed in that. Sorry about that. I got a speaker here bubbling in the background. Uh, but, uh, you know, and like over 200 people injured from that blast. And yet, all of a sudden, peace deals everywhere are breaking out. Russia's President Vladimir Putin said in a phone conversation with Turkey's President uh, Recep Tayyip, uh, Erdogan, on Wednesday, he had given instructions to the government to start talks with Turkey on the resumption of trade and economic cooperation. I mean, what is all this about? What is going on? And on top of it, Britain just exits the EU, seeming like no big deal, and it seemed to see the real, send the markets reeling there for a little bit, and 
But that's not the only reason. You know, I believe that, the, that Britain leaving the EU is part of a greater plan, and you're going to see why in a few moments, okay? So, Turkey is normalizing relationships with Russia. This must mean the sanctions are about to end for Russia. I mean, this is just strange things. Now, not only that, Turkey, this man here on your screen now that you see here, this was the leading suspect for killing of the Russian pilot. Of course, Erdogan apologizes for, for the pilot's death and and just sucks right up to the to President Putin, you know. And now suddenly an investigation has been reopened into the main suspect in the death of the Russian pilot that was shot down by Turkey over Syria in November. When Turkey was, was basically making this man a great hero, but now he's under investigation for the death. Just kind of weird, isn't it? Now look here, John Kerry unexpectedly admits Iran is helpful to U.S. in fighting ISIS in Iraq. Are, are you kidding me? I mean, I feel like Paul Bagley. Are you serious? This is nuts. I mean, now John Kerry is saying that I Iraq is helpful. I mean, if this is not a globalization of minds coming together to seeming to put to bury the uh, the hatchet, so to speak, on all their issues. Watch here. Look, we we have challenges. This is John Kerry quoted directly. Look, we have challenges with Iran, as everybody knows, and we are working on these challenges. Kerry told reporters, but I can tell you that Iran in Iraq has been in certain ways helpful and they clearly are for focus on ISIL Daesh and so we have a common interest actually he added I mean this is just nuts guys and then looky here Britain all right has Britain avoided a European super state What's this all about? You know, I mean, some people might, might question when I used express.co.uk. I know some people say, well, that's not a real good source for news and everything. I, I, I get that a lot because I used that the other day about the, the one that said the European super state to be unveiled, uh, EU nations to be morphed into, into a one post, uh, you know, into one. That was post to Brexit. Uh, Britain exiting the European Union. But some, friends, let me tell you something. This is something that's been going on for a long time. This was June 27, 2016. Germany's foreign minister, Frank Walter Steinme Steinmeier, and he's the one that's kind of spearheading this movement here, and his French counterpart, Jean-Marc uh, uh, Ayerault today, presented a proposal for a closer EU integration based on on three key areas, internal, external security, and the migrant crisis and economic cooperation. All right. Now, you might say, wait a minute, Steve, I thought we were going to be talking about the groundwork uh, that's being laid for, for, uh, for the third temple, you know. What's, well, wait a minute, where are we going? I'm trying to lay that groundwork for you so you can see. The Pope of Rome has been building up he has one world, new world order. He's been building everything up to it in order to bring about the third temple. So you have to understand, in order for the Pope to get the third temple built, the relationship between Turkey and Israel has to be satisfied. The relationship even between Turkey and Russia has to be satisfied. And the reason you have to understand that is because Turkey has been a major figure and the possibility of getting the Muslims to go along with the rebuilding of the third temple. You're going to see that in a few moments. I've brought it out in another broadcast. It's not a very good way about going about it, but they are using Turkey to try to spearhead this movement. All right. Now, on top of that, why Russia, though? Why Turkey and Russia? Well, Russia has ties with Mahmoud Abbas. So you have to understand, the Pope is not stupid. He knows he's got to get all these people together. So he puts pressure on Erdogan to get Erdogan to do a little bit of apologizing because why? He needs Russia in there because Russia can influence Mahmoud Abbas. Turkey uh, has great influence with the rabbis right now because they're all so happy about Turkey wanting to build the third temple. They can't even hardly stand it. Uh, and at, at the same time, the Pope has all the influence in the world on their Jordanians. So they have to bring about this peace pact there. And at the same time, in order to make Russia happy, you know, they got to get the United States to start sucking up a little bit to Iraq in order to kind of make everything look good. All right. Now, here, here's what happens, though. Now, we see the European super state to be unveiled, EU nations to be morphed into, into one, a super state. Now, by the way, this article here is nothing new to talk of a super state. 
in Russian media, when I was doing some research on the EU as a super state, I found an article, didn't, didn't remember to put it in here for you, but I found an article in the Russian language where, gosh, I don't know how long ago it was, six months ago, I believe it was, Russia was already speaking about how that they've longed to make the EU a super state and they likened it unto uh, Hitler's Nazi dream to have the Europe, Europe to be one big super state and that's what they're actually going to achieve now. They're going to achieve Hitler's dream. Hmm, wonder why though. Anyway, the foreign ministers of France, Germany are due to reveal a blueprint to effectively do away with individual member states in what is being described as an ultimatum. In other words, you ain't got no choice. You either join our super state or get out. All right. Under the radical proposal, EU countries will lose the right to have their own army, criminal law, taxation system, or central bank, with all powers being transferred to Brussels. Man, I should have did a little bit more homework, guys. I should have done some work on Brussels and the relationship to the Vatican. Now, I said to you guys over and over, well, Britain's exit was nothing more than a predetermined factor in this. And you might say, no, they were just avoiding this EU super state. In fact, this article over here actually speaks about that, that Britain was trying to avoid, as it says in there, has Britain avoided a European super state? It was planned. I can take you all the way back to 1942 and prove to you that. Look at your map right here. This was the post-war New World map that was going to be divided up into 10 regions, all right? This is an official map of the two, 10 regions of the world. Now, if you'll notice, I know it's a little bit small on your screen, so I'm gonna, I got a little blow up, get you a little bit closer here. You can see the United States, Canada, and Greenland, they're all supposed to be one section there, and uh, South America and Africa are going to be a section, and Russia's got a huge section. In fact, Russia is still showing that it was all the Soviet states there. Now, I have seen some up, updated versions of this map, and some of them still include some of the former Soviet states in this era, area. But none, nonetheless, let's just say that some of these states decide they want to go along with the super state, the EU super state, but let's say some of the others decide, no, we're going to keep our integrity. Remember, Russia is doing the Eurasia uh, thing to begin with. Eurasia includes, of course, they have China in there, but in this uh, 10 nation region here, China's not in there. But if you'll notice though, Iran is in there, who is also part of the Eurasia Pact, etc. And even so is Belarus and, and Kazakhstan and some of the other places that are already on here. But this is what I wanted to show you, though, that was interesting. We talk about Britain. Look at it as the map gets a little bit closer here on your screen. And hopefully for YouTube, if I can remember to do this, I'll actually take and put this full screen so you can see it. Britain itself is totally out of the EU, what is considered today modern day EU. But then again, so is East Germany and, and uh, Austria and, and Czechoslovakia and places like that as well. But my point being though, is even if let's say Germany and uh, Austria and some of these others decide to go along with being part of this EU super state, isn't it odd that Britain was totally separated from them all? In fact, Britain is actually still part of Australia and some other countries there that they have basically conquered anyway, except South Africa. In fact, I think South Africa, it doesn't show it on here very well, but there's a little red dot down there, an orange dot at the very bottom of South Africa, which I believe is Cape Town, which is a British colony as well. So kind of interesting. Now, whether or not they end up doing this or not, I can't say for sure, but my point is, is it does seem to indicate that Britain's exit of the EU was something that had been thought of for a long time. In fact, I watched recently the movie called Spotlight. It was a movie about the Catholic Church and how that uh, they stayed in this movie here about, I think it's 6% of the clergy is into pedophilia of children and things of that nature there. But what was interesting is the uh, one guy that was playing the Jewish uh, papers editor there, uh, 
or one of the people, I forget which guy was in the movie. Anyway, he said that the Vatican thinks in terms of centuries, not in just weeks, months, and days, you see. And so this is what I think about when I look at this map, even though it's from 1942, it's still a new world order that is in the mind of the Catholic Church to be able to dominate the entire world. So they're still thinking in centuries. So 1942 is no big deal, especially in light of the fact of the Nostri Aetate that they got the Jewish Congress to sign recently, getting rabbis from around the world to go along with the Vatican's pledge, and that was from back in 1965. Uh, so they're really always thinking ahead of how they're going to do it. Now, looking at this and looking at the globalization, look at the European Union, the super state that we're seeing here, looking at the ties that Russia is, is forming back with Turkey and Turkey with Israel and all these things here, I can't help but think of the wonderful scripture of Revelation 13 verses 16 through 18. And and he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Okay? And that no man might buy or sell, save, and I did it in different colors, he that had the mark. Okay? A lot of people say the mark's a microchip. All right? Whatever you want to say. That's fine. Or the name of the beast. So see, you're not limited to your microchip. You can have the mark or the name or the number of his name. So there's three different types of markings in here. Here is the wisdom. Let him that understand and count the number of the beast. Now, the beast is the power or the system, right? For it is the number of a man. That's a singular. And his number is 603 score and 6 or 666, as many people have break, broken that down to be. All right, so it's the number of a man, but that man represents the entire beast, the whole system. All right. Now, I've always believed that to be the Roman Catholic Church. That's just my personal opinion on that. Okay. Now, if you look also, this is another thing that really comes interesting to me. And I'm just throwing this out there as part of this New World Order agenda. And we're going to go back in in just a second here. We're going to fix and start tracing now this groundwork for the building of the Third Temple. Now, Pope Francis... Transcript from a video for Kenneth Copeland's meeting of ministers that he did uh, with uh, Tony Palmer. I was, I transcribed myself part of what he says there because I really wanted you to see this, what he says. The Pope says, I am yearning for that embrace. All right. He's talking about the embrace of bringing together all the Christian community. Now, of course, that just reminds me of Esau, as I've said, stated in other videos. The Holy Scripture speaks of when Joseph's brothers began to starve from hunger. So now he's typing himself to Joseph. They went to Egypt so they could buy, so that they could eat. They went uh, to buy. They had money, but they couldn't eat the money, he says. But there they found something more than food. They found their brother. All right, all of us have currency, the currency of culture, the currency of our history. We have a lot of cultural riches and religious riches, and we have diverse traditions, but we have to encounter one another as brothers. Isn't it interesting the Pope uses that analogy? And he says you can't eat your money, but he says you're going to have to encounter him as a brother. And if you do not encounter him as a brother, let me tell you something. He's telling you in a nice roundabout way, then you're not going to be getting any of the corn. Isn't it odd how that they're controlling the seed bank of the world? I think it's Monsanto that actually has all the seeds and everything else pretty much is nothing but a bunch of GMO. And you don't think that the Vatican is not the one behind all of this controlling the world's food supplies? Isn't it interesting? You cannot, you know, you can't, you got money, all right. All the nations of the world have got money. They've got currency. But as the Pope says, you can't eat your money. You're going to have to come and meet him as a brother. And if you don't accept him as a brother, then guess what? Saranara. Don't think the Pope ain't going to kick you out. Sure he will. Now, here's what's really baffling to me. All right? A new Muslim vision. Guess, let's, let's get back to the building of the third temple. 
for just a moment. Let me explain to you why the relationship between Turkey and Israel had to be reestablished. Let's look at it. This was from the Jewish press, March the 12th of 2013. A new Muslim vision, rebuilding Solomon's temple together. You know, this made headlines all over the world. But you know what? You didn't have this picture on your screen, though, when you got to read the article. As a devout Muslim, says the writer, and by the way, the writer of the article happens to be Sanim uh, Siapar, uh, uh, however you want to pronounce that name. That is a girl's name. It is not a guy's name. And the picture is not... Uh, the girl either writing the article this happens to be her lover who is also believed to be, to be uh, believed by many in the Turkish world to be the modern day Mahdi for the Muslim world he is also the man calling for the building of the third temple and he has got a relationship with the Pope of Rome not that they have met personally but the Pope of Rome has received his book from none other than uh, uh, Yeshayahu, uh, a Sanhedrin rabbi who gave him, delivered him uh, Adnan Akhtar's book. He is also known to be the head of a sex cult, a religious sex cult in Turkey, written by his own people. But before I get into this, read, this is an article that one of his kittens, as he calls them, writes in response to the building of the third temple. The article, by the way, looked majorly impressive. In fact, if you just read the article and know nothing behind the scenes, you'd fall right for it. Oh man, this is great. The, the, the Muslims in Turkey want to build the third temple and they love the Jews. Praise be to God is what it looks like, right? Watch this. She says here, as a devout Muslim, I take pleasure when Jews pray to Almighty God and they're praying anywhere in the world, including at the Temple Mount, would be a glad tiding for me as well. Now, I can only imagine when the Rabbi Yehuda Glick saw this article himself. He felt wonderful to see that the, that the Muslims were opening their arms to the Jews. And believe me, when I saw the article, I had not investigated anything in the background either. I would have done the same. I'd have been no different than Rabbi Glick. You know, the Muslims want to extend their hand out to the Jews. That's a nice thing to see, finally, right? It goes on to say, as a devout Muslim, she says, it would be a joy for me to see Prophet Solomon's temple rebuilt as well. No, you do not hear me wrong. Prophet Solomon's temple being rebuilt in all its magnificent and glory would be a great delight for me, as it would be to any Muslim. Under Now watch what she says, though. I got it in yellow here, and I hope you can see it big on your screen. She says, under different circumstances, in an atmosphere of trust, love, and brotherhood, Muslims would welcome this with enthusiasm. Huh. You know, it made world news, by the way, when this article came out. But if you go to the bottom of the article, there's a link on the Facebook to the article that you can click on, and I happen to put the picture up here for you. This young woman here, this part of that, now she used to have her picture on there, but when I put this out publicly before, she's removed her picture and put Turkey's flag in there instead. She didn't want you seeing who she really is, okay? She's trying to hide that now, but of course her lover's picture is still there, the guy that they consider to be the Mahdi, that also believes because he has been reared up under the Catholic uh, uh, built religion of the Muslims there. So he is a believer that Yeshua will return. And of course, he believes that Yeshua will walk hand in hand with him up to the Temple Mount. And he's also stated that the Pope of Rome will be there too when the third temple is built. Now, what do you know about that? That's kind of odd, isn't it? Well, you, you'll think it more odd when you see who the man really is. This is not just some kind of great Turkish Muslim guy for the building of the third temple and his group was all for it. No, let me show you some things here. First, let's look at something here. She made the comment that they would be, if it was built, let me, let me share it again. She said, as long as it would be, to, to, it'd, be, it'd be this for any Muslim under different circumstances and another atmosphere of trust, love, and brotherhood. In other words, there's got to be a different atmosphere. The Jews can't be in control of it, in other words, but it's got to be a brotherly love atmosphere. All right, Pope Francis, Christians and Muslims are brothers and sisters. Well, 
That's a different atmosphere, isn't it? Worthynews.com, December 1st, 2015. Pope Francis says, Christians and Muslims are brothers and sisters. We must therefore consider ourselves and conduct ourselves as such. Those who claim to believe in God must also be men and women of peace, he states. Now, also, Pope Francis calls Jews big brothers of church uh, uh, of uh, Christ Christ anniversary. That's the title of the article. Reuters, November 10th, 2013. Photographs are mine, by the way, here. Uh, Pope Francis described the Jewish people as the big brothers of his Roman Catholic flock on Sunday in words of solidarity. The Jews are the big brothers of the Roman Catholic Church. Has anybody missed what I just read to you there? Have you realized that the Pope of Rome says that they're the big brothers of his Roman Catholic flock? I believe Shimon Perez would definitely be one of those flocks there. He used to go to a Catholic school when he lived in Poland. What do you expect? We renew our closeness and solidarity to the Jewish people, our big brothers, and pray to God that the memory of the past and of the sins of the past helps us to be always vigilant against every form of hate and intolerance, Francis told thousands in St. Peter's Square in his Sunday Mass. In other words, anybody that says anything against what the Pope has to say needs to be silenced. That's what he's saying in a nutshell. In other words, we did it all along. We were bashing the Jews and killing them and helping making sure that Hitler murdered thousands and millions, etc. But if anybody dares speak against the Pope of Rome now, now it'll be a, it'll be a penitentiary offense and sin, sure enough. Not good, friends. Not good at all. Pope Francis embraces rabbi Muslim leader at the Western Wall. So now you have the three faiths together as brothers. Isn't that exactly what this lady says over here? You know, as long as it would be under different circumstances and an atmosphere of trust, love, and brotherhood. So who's the one that is bringing that brotherhood together? It is the Catholic Church. They are preparing the ground for the building of the third temple. Now, I'm not just saying that lightly, friends. Now, there's some things that I'm not going to be bringing out in this message tonight, but I'm going to tell you one thing. I will share this much with you. There is a major move right now in Israel, in the old city of Jerusalem, major secret meetings are going on for the building of the third temple. I'm talking about government officials. We're talking about specialists, archaeologists, historians, everything you can name. They are getting ready to build the third temple on the Temple Mount and getting all the necessary things in order to justify the building of the third temple on the Temple Mount. That is not a joke. But here's what concerns me. They're using the Turkish people to help unify the Muslim world. But who is this Adnan Akhtar? This very man, that this writer that did the article in the Jewish press that excited the whole Jewish world and saying, oh, this is a wonderful thing. The Muslims are finally from Turkey are all going to be friends and want us to build the third temple. Well, let's take a look at that. Because we have Yeshayahu Hollander, who's the rabbi you see here in the picture with Pope Francis, he is giving the, a gift to uh, Pope Francis. And by the way, it was written in the article, totally unheard of, of Pope Francis to receive gifts personally. Okay, but he got it, and the gifts were from a good friend of his. He, like I said, he's a Sanhedrin rabbi. The, friend were, the, the, the gifts, the book, and a couple of other things that he gave to him were all from Adnan Akhtar, which... Uh, Rabbi Yeshayahu Hollander had gotten personally from a meeting that he had with Adnan Akhtar. Okay, so here we go. Let's look at Adnan Akhtar. And by the way, if you see the picture on your screen, if it doesn't disgust you as it does me, I have a, a feel for these women that are all been made up by doctors. They've taken and done implants and everything else to deform their bodies. And Adnan Akhtar, uh, there's been a lot of things written about him. It is not good. But the article here, this is the Daily News, October 2nd, 2014, by William Armstrong wrote, The Mahdi wears uh, Armani, the bizarre world of Adnan Akhtar. Now, by the way, I did an article on here already on YouTube. If you go back to YouTube and you can find it there, I did an article about Adnan Akhtar where his own personal friend exposed who he was. And that personal friend happens to be a renowned uh, Turkish man. He is a renowned author, best-selling author, and, uh, and, and he exposed this man and tried, and he's, of course, he's a Muslim, uh, but 
he said basically that he's, he, has, he runs nothing but a sex cult. And all these women that are dressed the way they are, they all have bleached blonde hair, they all have weird looking eye makeup on, and I'm not against people that wear makeup, but I mean, this is like overkill here, and they've all been deformed in their physical features in order to make him happy in the way that he has these issues. Anyway, let me write, read to you what William Armstrong writes here. The movie of Adnan Akhtar, a.k.a. Haran Yahya, uh, that's what he calls himself, uh, has been described as, as an Islamic sex cult supporting Turkey's prime minister peddling a sexed-up Disney version of Islam, presiding over a network of surgically enhanced uh, Gucci-clad followers. Akhtar is perhaps the world's foremost Islamic creationist and is widely ridiculed by social scientists as a little more than a charlatan or a crackpot. Still... His eye-catching brand of Islam has proved a lucrative and tenacious force in Turkey and abroad for almost three decades, and at least one doctoral student has apparently deemed it worthy of deeper academic study. The resulting 250-page book by Anne Ross Solberg, published by uh, Sultantorn University in Sweden and also available for free online, ends up being one of the more en entertaining doctor uh, doctoral theses that one is likely to come across. Now, to me, I would be ashamed to be associated with a man like this. Now, I don't think the likes of Rabbi Glick or these other rabbis here that have actually gone and met with this man whether or not they know or knew beforehand, you know, I would have to say probably Rabbi Glick probably had no idea. And I don't say that because I met Rabbi Glick myself. I say that because I know that when the article came out about Turkey uh, embracing the idea of building Solomon's Temple, I was just excited. In fact, I didn't realize who Adnan Akhtar was until just recently, and that article is almost three years old. Okay? So... Rabbi Glick, though, was invited, not by Adnan Akhtar personally, but by a whole group, and I'm sure Adnan Akhtar was the one behind it, but it was invited by an entire group of Muslim leaders to come during the month of Ramadan to celebrate with them. Now, I couldn't have done that either because I'm not into that, but that's, Rabbi Glick, is, that's, he's got his own right to do what he feels to, led to do, all right? But I know Rabbi Glick is a staunch supporter for building the Third Temple, so to see anyone that would be that would that would embellish the idea for building the third temple is a dream for him. But when it comes to the word of Almighty God, that has to take preeminence over all these things. And, you know, you might ask me, why didn't you say anything to, to Rabbi Glick while you were there? Well, one, I was only there as the camera guy. Secondly, when Rabbi Glick came in, we were at the Knesset, it was like, 20 minutes with, with Brother Bagley, and he had to go. And so there was no time for talking or nothing. But perhaps, perhaps if he sees this video, because I know he does watch our channel as well, just like he does with uh, Pastor Bagley there, perhaps he will recognize who Adnan Akhtar really is, and he might make that distance from him anyway. Who knows? But the point is, is rabbis have, because of the fact that this man here has embraced the building of the Third Temple, they are willing to deal with all the nonsense because they long for the building of the third temple. They have failed to recognize that we are that temple. Not a temple with hands. All right? Now, anyway, let's move on, though. This here is what's, plan is what's coming. They're looking at building a third temple. According to Rabbi Yehuda Glick, and Paul Begley shared this with me. I know he's already done a video on it. He did it with Rabbi Yehuda Glick. They're actually showing this temple here being a little bit too close to the Dome of the Rock because the actual intention is between the two of those is to build a museum for all nations. Okay, and I even shared this with Brother Begley just last, uh, last night. I shared with him, I said, Brother Begley, I said, that might be what the scripture meant in Revelation 11 when it says, leave out the outer court is given unto the Gentiles. And that got Brother Begley as well.
Now, okay, so I say they're laying the groundwork. As I said, right now, going on in Jerusalem as we speak in the old city, what you're seeing right here, there is secret things happening that I am privy to. And when I am allowed to tell you what is actually happening, I will tell you that will be in just the coming days. But I can tell you right now, they are working on the justification for building the third temple here on the Temple Mount. This is why you've seen the relationships in the world change so rapidly. The Pope of Rome is desperate to get this temple built because he knows he's got a little time, friends. Remember the message I did on Daniel 11, and we're going to conclude in that in just a minute. But let me show you something. Some of you might be saying right now, well, Steve, you know, that can't be because, you know, we see Bob Cornuke, you know, he came out with this uh, big thing about, you know, Mount Zion is where the temple really actually sat. Okay. All right. I understand that. Uh, uh, Bob Cornuke was not the man that originally discovered this. It was a man by the name of Klein. And uh, Klein is a Jewish believer. He actually wrote me several years back. He sent me his documentary he did on this. And, and, and according to a good friend of mine there in Israel, Brother Roddy, Brother Roddy shared with me as well that even Klein had taken the idea from another man yet uh, that, that the third temple was actually there on Mount Zion. Well, actually, if you whether you realize this or not, Mount Moriah and Mount Zion are basically all one mountain anyway because Mount Zion is the highest point right there and it's working its way downhill to the Kidron Valley. All right, now there may be technically two points there. All right, I don't say that there is or is not. There may be technically two points. But I know that uh, uh, Mr. Klein, when he contacted me, and we talked on the phone extensively. He said that the problem is, is there was no water source for the Temple Mount on uh, what we call the Temple Mount today, where the Dome of the Rock is. There was no water source for, to get the water to wash the blood out from the Temple sacrifices. Same argument is made by Bob Cornuke. And of course, they talk about many things from the scriptures about Mount Zion being God's holy mountain. It is. I know that for a fact. Mount Zion is God's holy mountain. But as I say, it's still basically the same. The whole city is built on the same mountain. Now, there might be a little tiny peak somewhere that, that, you know, that we can't see with the natural eyes so well. But when it comes to the water source, Bob Cornuke, Mr. Klein, all of these guys that have come up with this, and I know Chuck also has backed Bob Cornuke, but Bob and him are very good friends. They've been friends for years. He's backing his idea as well. But I have to totally disagree with Bob Cornuke, and I'm indebted to... Uh, to uh, a, a dear brother, I won't call his name, but he actually shared with me some information to look at. I've done some research on my own, and I want to show you something. And this, and, and this was doing my own research, but the brother that, that shared these things with me, I, I don't have permission to say his name, so I won't say it as of yet, but we, he'll be here with me on an interview very soon, and we'll talk about this together when the time is appropriate. All right, but let me share with you something. He steered me in the right direction. All right, now not far from, uh, from Jerusalem, there is what is called the Three Solomon's Pools. The south, this is the southwest of Bethlehem, and this is seen, uh, the aerial view here is seen from the west, what you're seeing in there in the background. These are huge. It's like the length of four football fields is how big these huge water pools are. Now, this was time from the temple period that this was actually built, right? Now, I want to show you something else. And again, for those of you who are going to be watching on YouTube, I'll put these full screen for you so you can see it a little bit better better. This here is a schematic, a picture of Jerusalem's water supply with the elevation figures in there of the, of the terrain, the distance as the crow flies, as you would say. From the south left, south uh, to the north, it's about, a, about 20 kilometers, and the differences in the gradients between the aqueducts, okay? Now, Solomon's Pool is, a, is about the midway point and it's at an elevation starting off at 800 meters uh, above sea level, uh, dropping all the way down to 765 meters above sea level. And then by the time it goes from there to the upper city, it's 760 meters above sea level. And then by the time you get down to the Temple Mount, it's 735 meters above sea level. Now this water is working its way down at the high, at the high point of 890 meters uh, above sea level, it is working its way all the way down to the old city. 
All right, so yes, there is a major water source. Anybody knows anything about water and water pressures and how these things work, it's just like where I come from in Alabama, we have water towers. When you have water pumped up into a water tower, all that water is putting pressure on those pipes so that when you come down to the other end, as long as the pipe is, uh, is lower than the water tower, that water is going to come busting out. All right, doesn't matter how you look at it, it's going to bust out because of the pressure. 890 meters uh, above sea level compared to the Temple Mount at 735 meters above sea level is over 100 meters or 300 feet or in this case here like a 30 foot, uh, 30, 30, not 30 feet, but 30 story tall building. All right, that's a huge building. In other words, that's a tremendous amount of water pressure down there at the Temple Mount. So that's like if you turn on the garden spigot, man, you got a lot of pressure backed up on that water line. I don't care if it's a, it could be a four inch water line. It would be massive amounts of water pressure. All right, and it doesn't end there either, guys. Archaeologically speaking, right here, this is called a Roman siphon blocks of the upper aqueduct of Jerusalem at a display in the courtyard of the Rockefeller Museum. Uh, these are, they show the male size with, with the projections there. In other words, what it was, and this friend of mine explained to me, that these stones were connected together and that the scientists know that, that they had to build it this way because the water pressure was so great when it came down. And these pipes are right here in the image as well. They show them where they connected them at. Uh, where they had to do this one place where they had to connect these pipes together, the, the water pressure was tremendous. And every one of them, if I'm not mistaken, has a name engraved on, on who made that particular pipe for that, just like modern water supplies of today. It's made the exact same way, all right? Now, so it totally debunks the idea. And by the way, this is a huge aqueduct right there by Joppa Gate, and, and there are many many aqueducts in the old city right there, by the way. Uh, and, and, and the thing is, here's what's strange. This, I can tell you this, one of the things that the archeologists are working on doing right now is they're, they're mapping out exactly how the aqueducts went and fed the Temple Mount. Because they, actually, they have a model from a historian from a little while back that clearly defines that that's the way the Temple Mount got the water. And by the way, it doesn't go to Mount Zion, it goes right to the Temple Mount. Now, Bob Cornuke, as well as Klein, always said that that was a military garrison, but according to the historians that have done, that have done work on this as well, say that the garrison was actually over there on the Mount of Olives. It wasn't there on the Temple Mount. It's totally ludicrous. And of course, they use the scriptures saying that not one stone would be left upon another. They quote you, Yeshua and what he says there and that is true but it's what's interesting in their own writings they say that the temple mount walls no that's not what Yeshua says they asked Yeshua about the buildings on the mount there and he says not one stone would be left upon another and you can still see today in the underground tour there outside the temple mount the stones from the temple itself laying there on the ground all twisted up I mean, it's almost as if history is laying there in plain sight for you to see that, yes, this was the actual place. So, all right, now, with all that said and done, let me just say this. Even if you want to believe that Bob Cornuke's theory is right, or, or Mr. Klein, whoever you heard it from first, Klein is the one that I know said it long before Bob Cornuke. Bob Cornuke is really good about taking somebody's story and building on it himself. That's his business. I have no problem with that, all right? But... The point being is this, all right, in either situation, it doesn't matter. What they're trying to do is to justify building the third temple there on the Temple Mount. That is what they're wanting to do. They want to build it there. They want to do it there because the Pope of Rome wants it there. This is why you see the relationships that you're seeing going on, the reestablishment with Turkey and Israel, why they have to have a good relationship. Adnan Akhtar is the key guy for them in order to get the third temple pushed, and he's really backing uh, 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 the President Erdogan in doing so. And, of course, Turkey and uh 
Jordan has a good relationship as well. And of course, we already know the Pope of Rome has a great relationship with the Jordanians. Now, they're trying to make it look like the Pope and the Turkish are not so great at having their relationships and stuff like that. That's all over Armenia. But you know what? The Pope of Rome was just in Armenia the other day. And what was he doing while he was there? You need to reestablish your relationship with Turkey. Well, what do you know? What a statesman, isn't he? He's making sure that all the deals are taken care of just right. So when we go back to the book of Daniel here, let me just remind you, and down, let's get down to verse 44. I want to share this with you all over again, okay? So let me get to it. Daniel chapter 11, verse 44 here. Let me start at 42. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver, and over all precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and Ethiopians will flow at his heels. Okay, now this is a different translation than KJV. Uh, it says, but rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch... Uh, the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Now, notice what it says here. Let's back it up again one more time. All right, then he will stretch out his hand against other countries and the land of Egypt will not escape, all right, see? But he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver over all the precious things of Egypt. Well, you know, it just so happens that Italy has all the rights to the oil and stuff off of Egypt. And why was it that the United States caused uh, the Arab Spring there? You know, Hillary Clinton was doing a great thing for the Catholic Church when they caused the Egyptian government to topple over like it did and, and just turn the whole country into oblivion. Well, see, now the Italian government gets all the rights to the oil and the treasures and the precious things, not to mention all the gold they have in the Vatican anyway. In Ethiopia, by the way, according to KJV, he, it falls in his steps. Well, of course, guess what they're doing over there? The, the Vatican-backed oil company, Gulf International over there, happens to be in there and making sure that anybody that gets in the way to where they want to uh, drill at, well, they've already got their little thugs in the government that comes in there and blows a loud horn. I've shared that on our Israeli News Live before as well. They either pack up and leave now or they die. That's exactly what they do. And then the Vatican goes in there and hosts that big mural on their on St. Peter's Basilica in honor of the bank that was loaning all the money for this. Of course. Why? Because it's Gulf International that's doing, that's got the investments there. And they don't want to disturb Gulf International because the Vatican owns a lot of stock in this oil company here. So yes, they have control of that as well. But the thing that I was sharing with you on the, on the broadcast the other night is this here. When it says right here in verse 44, but rumors from the east and from the north, actually, the word shamaot, shamaot. In other words, he hears something. In other words, tidings from the east. And if you take the north and change it to hidden, which the word Safon means hidden. In other words, the hidden ones. Remember Psalm 83, they have consulted against thy hidden ones. That is the, Moses and Elijah who have been hidden away for that future purpose there. But he hears that tidings. Now what's interesting is he hear, notice Revelation 12:12. 12, 12, he hears in heaven because it says in heaven that, 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 the, that the angel says, the kingdoms of the Lord have become our Lord's. I'm just paraphrasing that. See, and then Satan was thrown out. Well, guess where Moses and Elijah is hidden in the first place? They're hidden in heaven. Where do you think Yeshua is? He comes from the east. Is that right? So Satan already knows that, that Moses and Elijah is about to return, paving the way for Yeshua, the Messiah, to return. So that's where those hid, that's where those tidings are coming from. It's from the east and from the hidden there, the hidden ones that are there. All right? And, it, and actually what it says, it causes him panic. And he goes forth in a rage to make away many. Now, we might think of that as Russia and, 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 uh, and China being the north and the east. But I believe it's that spiritual application right there. In other words, the Pope of Rome, he is going to be annoyed, whether it be him or somebody else. And let me tell you something. Don't think that the Vatican maybe haven't taken and cloned themselves a little guy out of the blood off of this tunic that Martin Luther actually called a relic of garbage to begin with. 
all right? Don't think that something big isn't going on in the background, but nonetheless, he wants to build what? He wants to build his royal, royal pavilion in the beautiful holy mountain there. What holy mountain? He wants to build it right there in Israel, and he wants to build it on the Temple Mount. And according to the Turkish people, as that woman that wrote the article said, they need somebody. They need to just change how things are going, someone that will do it as brothers. Well, you've got your guy that'll do that, the Pope of Rome, calling everybody brothers, and even the Jews, the older brothers. And unfortunately, my brother and the Jews have fallen for all of this. I am very disturbed by it, very disturbed. You know what? Satan knows he has a little bit of time. And I don't say that Satan is here yet, but he's soon to be cast out. One thing's for sure. Satan's already anointing them to make the way to get everything ready because he's about to be thrown out. The two witnesses are about to come on the scene and Christ is about to enter the Eastern Gates. I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching Israeli News Live. Shalom and God bless you.